Hello, folks. Good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, depending on where in the world you are. My name is Michael Carducci, and I am joined here in the virtual studio with David Seitz, and I'm probably mispronouncing that. Am I close? No, you got my name correct. Ah, perfect. And we are going to talk about data as a service. So, uh, so both David and I are practicing software architects, uh, working in different fields. In fact, I'm a principal architect at a very data heavy information focused company and data as a service is a topic that's new to me. So I am very excited to dive into this as I, I assume a lot of the folks here joining us are as well. So just to kind of give you a quick introduction, this, um, this webinar is sponsored by No Fluff Just Stuff, providers of the absolute best live training and live conference experiences for folks in our industry here in the United States. And um, it's been a challenging year, of course, but we are very excited to start looking back into resuming our live events going into 2021. Right now, we are tentatively looking at UberComp being a hybrid event in July, and that is our flagship event. So if you've been, if you really want to dive deeper into some of these topics, definitely check that out. And of course, right now, there are some insane deals going on. So uh, do check out nofluffjuststuff.com. We've got the combo pass. We've got the golden ticket, which is the most insane deal that I've seen in my life. So definitely take advantage of that while it's still available. There are just a few days left and just a couple of seats left. So take advantage of that. But enough of the contractually obligated commercial announcements. Let's actually get into the meat of the content. David, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's been a, uh, as you said, it's been a challenging year, but for our profession, it hasn't stopped. It keeps growing and I'm learning all the time. And this has been a great opportunity for me to learn. So I've been doing a lot of research, a lot of learning, talking to colleagues. I'm loving it. You and me both, sir. This is, um, you know, this is kind of an opportunity to, to reset, retool and, um, you know, and, and, and a lot of changes have come out of this. And so, uh, so certainly... Uh, I find myself more and more drawn into the gravity of this uh, this field, and and so tell me a little bit about data as a service. Can you give me the the elevator pitch? Uh, because I, I think we can connect some dots, but I, I really want to get to the to the heart of, of of what you're describing here. Sure. So data as a service is not the traditional from 2008 data as a service monolith. Um, simply, you know masking all of the databases behind it. Data as a service started, I'd say about five, maybe six years ago, I started thinking about it. Um, I'm originally from the data world, um, master of, of a few, you know, jack of all trades. And one thing that I found out was that metrics and reporting was always an afterthought, monitoring, afterthought, auditing, afterthought. So all these applications are being built out um, and then afterwards, they're, they're talking about what well, can we report out on this or can we monitor that and can we know how it's going. And the other thing that we're finding out is it's really hard to move. So in the IM world, in the information management department, um, I always heard, yeah, but we do it differently than the application teams. We have to do it differently. And I always started wondering why, how different are we? In IT, I is information. There's no IT without I. So everything is data. I don't care if you're an application or if you're doing a report or if you're putting up a, a GUI for a person to update their, their, their profile. Um, the big thing is this, we need to be able to handle data the same way applications do in real time. And we can't make data an afterthought, especially when it comes to reporting, when it comes to um, security, when it comes to um, doing big data metrics, machine learning. So all of this really needs to be integrated. So what I did is I started visiting application departments and teams and saying, how do you build it? And that's um, back about four or five years ago, teams were telling me, oh yeah, we use brokering. We use something called microservices. And I started really learning about that. I started going to your conferences um, at No Fluff Just Up, talking with Mark Richards and Neil Ford and, and learning about microservices. And that was, that was further back. And agile architecture and then started looking at this i said there's got to be a better way than etling batch jobs and the traditional thing in fact if i can just share my screen real quickly here yeah let's see it uh, this is probably let me make it a little bigger here Ooh, a little too big this is probably what everyone is used to i, I take it everyone can see my screen 
Uh, I know I can. I can't speak for everybody okay. here, but that's uh, at All least right. a good indication. <laughs> okay. So what's interesting, I got a few monitors. I'm looking off to the side. Um, this is a traditional monolith, right? And, and we have a BI tool such as, I don't know, whatever you're using, MicroStrategy or whatever tools you're using. I'm not just picking on that tool, but any of them. Um, a big BI tool, you have the semantic layers, you've got the, the, the analyzing engines, you've got the dashboards, which go to the report, which go to the data set, which go to the semantic layer, which go to the on access layer, which go and then go to the structures, even for the unstructured stuff, we have to structure it. Maybe you're using Hive or Hortonworks or whatever there. And what happened was one piece breaks, the OLAP engine or the scheduler breaks and the OLAP is not refreshed and everything would go down. And I started looking at it and what I said was, my God, that's SOA. We built SOA. And that so I started looking at it. Saying, it won't, right. And I said, we, we spent $13 million building out a SOA platform. And so I started thinking, what is the app teams doing? When I visited them, I saw that they're brokering with microservices loosely coupling in real time eventing. I started thinking that this is really cool stuff. So what I did is I came up with, in my mind, um, a different pattern, which is let's follow the same way applications manage their transactions as events. But instead of a transaction such as I purchased something or I'm looking up a status for my order, um, instead we're moving data. And so as I started building out uh, the platform, mimicking what these application teams were doing with microservices, I found a few things that were just a marriage made in heaven for the IM world. When we ETL something, we batch it. Why? Because it takes a lot of processing power. So what if I could process data provision, each data as it happens, when it happens, through brokering? All of a sudden, my microservices, which can scale um, horizontally instead of vertically, I can scale up and down at each step in my ETL process. Now, that's huge if you've done ETL and big data management because it's a pain when I do millions of rows and one conks out and the whole batch is gone. Where do you pick up from there? With this, with microservices, I can not only... Um, you know, log as it's happening each event. But if one goes bad, okay, log it, throw it off to the side, stream keeps going. It doesn't stop the rest of the data. Plus, which was really helpful, I can change microservices. Little steps in the data provisioning process and my workflow. So let's say I'm going to um, take a person's name and I want to mask it for, or opsification because of security, right? Um, we're going to change the phone numbers. I can create a microservice that does just that, and it passes the data along. It, it takes it off the topic, passes it along. I can make marts. So I always said there's no such thing as a data lake. It's more of a swamp. So what happens is I can create marts at any point behind a microservice. And those marts can be based upon what is needed when they're needed. And if I don't need them anymore, because the customer says I'm done with this research I've been doing for three months, I can blow away the mark and that microservice and the rest of the flow keeps going. I'm not doing big deployments of my, of my system or big changes. So that's where I started really looking at this. And one thing I found out was, boy, it's hard to maintain because in brokering, I got to set up the topic. I don't know what topic is coming in. Unlike application teams who know their process and it's all written out, when it comes to data, data is dynamic. I don't know what the content is going to be. So sometimes I might have a credit card that's being processed and credit card data, but I might have a customer record. I might have, I'm processing different things all the time. And so in the traditional ETLing, I'd always have to make sure those data models and schemas from source all the way out is maintained. And that's a pain, especially in relational databases, big pain. Oh yeah. So I love, I love NoSQL. I mean, I adore it. I start using it, but I figured there's gotta be a better way than just NoSQL. And that's when I came out with uh, thinking, what if the architecture, this pattern is not just brokering and microservices, that's architecturally there. What if I added a new attribute to this architectural pattern? What if I added a data model? This, a data model helps define this pattern. 
That's what makes this pattern different than others. And that is I use metadata to dynamically build topics on the broker. And if something's listening to the topic, it gets provisioned. If not, let's say I'm using Kafka, for example, it's got the seven day retention. Okay, after seven days, it's being cleaned out. Um, but as I want to, I can do a plug model, a plug-in model, hook and plug and say, okay, here's a microservice. I want to provision this step of this data and I can pop it in. And all of those steps, that orchestration is dynamically built on the fly during runtime through metadata. So if you think about it, I can create a topic that is on types of clothing that's being sold, not just orders, but orders that are clothing that come from the iStore. All of a sudden, my metadata becomes really important because it defines my data provisioning workflow on the fly all the time. No code deploy, nothing. And so what was really interesting was, I'll go back to this, I started looking at other things thinking, well, what happens if I want to replay? And that's why I created something called the Genesis topic. In this pattern, the Genesis topic is where everything goes and the raw is kept and then flows down. If I ever want to replay, I can pull from raw and replay it down the flow. So in which case, I don't have to say I lost all of my data marks that I calculated. I can recalculate if I wanted to. So it became, a, and the other thing that became really privy to me is um, being able to have microservices and RESTful endpoints to consume data, I could control who has access to that data. How do they want it formatted? And what we found out was, and there's different experiences that I went through, but in my career on this, but one of them was really interesting. Someone said, I want it as a CSV file. I said, oh, okay, so we created a microservice that sends it as binary as a CSV file, create it on the fly, here's your CSV, stream it out. They used it, and then when they were done, about six months, they threw it away, we did. It only took us five and a quarter hours to build. I'm not kidding. It, our duration went from 16 days, three teams, traditionally, ETLing in the whole bit. We were able to get it down to five and a quarter hours. That means someone came in and said, listen, I want to source data. We have some records that are being coming in. And I said, that's not a problem. There's our sourcing endpoint. Go ahead. It's no SQL, whatever format you want. And then what we did have to build was the actual microservices that did the provisioning um, because all of the topics were created on the fly. And then the provisioning service we did right with a consumption service. And when they were done with it, no harm done. I'm not feeling guilty. There's no financial guilt. You can throw it away. And that made a huge change in how fast time the market. We became really focused on MVP instead of the monolith and saying, no, you didn't give us all the requirements up front. It's going to be another six months. So a company that was moving agile, this was an agile architecture. And it just it worked. So that's the, the root basis of it, of, of how it came about and, and real, real quick elevator speech wasn't that quick, I guess, but. No, but there's a lot of value in there. And so, so interestingly, this is similar to an architecture that, that I've just been defining for, for sort of data ingestion flow. So the, the piece that I want to, I want to dive in a little deeper on and by the way, if anybody uh, anybody live on the webinar right now, uh, do take advantage of the chat. We, uh, if you've got questions as they come up, uh, I'm moderating, so I'm watching the chat. Uh, I think David, you could probably see the chat as well. Yep. Uh, but just yep. in case, I'm keeping an eye on it here. But uh, so any questions that come up, go ahead and add them. You know, anywhere you want to dive a little deeper into, let us know. Uh, but in the absence of that right now, I, I want to dive a little more into the dynamic provisioning. You know, I, I want. Uh, you know, so, so I think I've got a, a good feel for what you're describing in terms of uh, the the these this event streaming and being able to drop nodes in there or drop services in there, uh, take them out and all of this dynamically. And, and I love this. I love this because it does a couple of key things. One is we build some largely immutable architecture 
uh, we've got this, this, this system of plumbing and it doesn't have to change and it doesn't have to, and, and our services are, get a lot more static because if we want to add capabilities, it's not, I don't have to go in there and take an existing service and rip some stuff out and throw some stuff in and run my tests and hope I didn't miss anything and throw it in production. And oops, I can just, I can just add a Lego brick to the yeah. existing architecture. But let's and, talk and about, the, oh, go ahead. You sorry. know what you just said though? You just said something really important that I just want to hit on. Sorry for interrupting. No, 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 no. You talked about testing. And you know how many people I've heard from the IM world say it's impossible to test our data provisioning. It goes in batches. It's all this. You have no idea. I got millions of records. How do I test it? And so they never even unit test because the things are so big. But with microservices, I can unit test just that one little step in the provisioning mm -hmm. and know it's 100% correct. And then I can plug it in. And that for us, you, you should have saw our quality go out the door. It was awesome because our quality got so much better. And we were able to prove that microservice does exactly what we said it would do. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was like, as soon as you said that, that was my big thing always is testing. It was hard. It's hard yeah. to test when you're batching everything up. Well, in fact, um, you know, I'm a big proponent of, a uh, big fan of the book by Mark Richards and Neil Ford, which I'm sure I have a copy of Fundamentals of Software Architecture. I really uh, yes. love the, Great book. Um, I really love the way that they they look at at all of these different architecture styles in one section of the book where they where they where they compare and contrast all of these different architectural styles. And that's one of the things they say about event driven architectures is that they can be difficult to test as well. But when you're this granular, and 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 you're almost it's it's almost they're they're almost the scope of functions your microservices. They're, yes, they're small even by microservice standards. And that becomes trivially easy to test. You put a message in, what comes out? And, yep. and then I love tools like, um, uh, like approval tests that, that basically will serialize a result and compare mm -hmm. it against a known good. So I'm not sitting here asserting this, 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 and this. I just say, does this object match this expected object? Yes or no. And, yep. and now I can write my tests in minutes. I can deploy in minutes. Uh, this is this is wonderful. Now, tell me a little more about the dynamic provisioning. Sure. Um, so what's interesting is the dynamic provisioning is based upon that metadata. So one of the biggest things about the metadata is what's the source, the unique ID of the source. So if I'm sourcing from a, a source of engagement application, um, it has its own unique ID for that object that's sending over, whatever the structure may be. Um, as well as categories, subcategories, you can make whatever you want of how fine granularity you want in that hierarchy. And it's wrapped up, the data is wrapped up with the metadata, so it's really packaged. And that's why there's that attribute called data object. You can call it whatever you want, but in my DAS software development kit that I produced, and it's out there for open source, anyone to use, it makes it really easy because it already has all the metadata mapped out. So when you send it in, it will use all that metadata and say, oh, according to this, here's a category, subcategory, that combination, here's a category, that's another topic on Kafka, and here's a source and category combination, all these pseudo surrogate keys. Now, those topics I could create by the actual value, or I could just say, hey, it's the iStore clothing topic, or the iStore order topic, if you're doing, you know, if your iStore is your application and you're selling clothes or whatever. So what's really interesting is I even do that in my workshop that I did in the art comp on December. We had a workshop where we built the entire platform out working and running. And we went from people that just started out never wrote this before using the software development kit. And we had it all working by end of day. And I mean, we were moving data around the whole bit and we were learning as we were going. So it didn't take all day. It's just, we were learning as we went. And what was really amazing is people were starting to say, I get it. I see how easy it is to move from one to another. And we changed the iStore to my store, let's say. And all of a sudden, the data provisioning that listens to the data coming in for the my store closing orders wasn't getting hit. No, of course not, because the data that was coming in was from my store dot clothing orders. 
And so what's nice is you can even start using that to dynamically, you know, topics were being populated dynamically. I didn't change anything. I just changed the data that came in. And all of a sudden, it's the new topic is up and running and, and off it goes. And that's with Kafka. So we were using Kafka on that one, which is fantastic. Love Kafka, by the way. Um, with auto topics created. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. Um, that's not a thing that I've done with, with uh, the auto creation of topics. Yeah, that was the key. That's where I really had a hard time trying to figure out how to do it because I don't want to maintain it. Like I said, with application teams, it's different. They have a very clean business process defined ahead of time. With IM world, we don't. We don't know what the data is going to be. And so that's a, a pattern in a usage of it that, that came in that I started using. And what was interesting, side note also, so I, I work at a, a, a nonprofit organization, IAPP, um, for um, privacy. And one thing that hit me was how much this pattern is perfect for privacy by design. I can actually now say this data is not intended to go there. Therefore, you're not going to use it for marketing. It is for billing. And our customer wants to make sure that we're not using the data for ill intent. Um, so the DAS pattern really starts helping us to orchestrate. It's data driven, not manual, um, and not through some application where someone put in a hook and starts listening to some big service you didn't know about or hitting a database you didn't know about. It's really driven by the data. So in this way, only we're only using the data the way it was intended. And that's it. And I can go on. And I, I, I have a whole development kit just on privacy. I did a workshop just on privacy. Um, and the DAS pattern adopts that privacy um, SDK that I wrote. So there's a whole bunch of strategies that it actually implements out of the box for privacy. Everything from data lineage trackers um, to data usage agreements, um, all of these strategies that come in out of the box in, in the SDK that I wrote. So it's kind of interesting how it can really start growing and being used, this architectural pattern. So I want to I want to pause here for just a moment and thank Jonathan Hughes for linking to the DAS oh. SDK in the chat there. So thank you for that. I'm actually going to check that out myself. So sure. I want to dive into a couple of topics in the absence of um, of any additional uh, any any questions coming in from the chat. And one of them is so you and I have taken different approaches to solve this problem. And, and I want to, and I want to dig a little deeper and compare and contrast those two approaches. So I have general topics. Uh, now, now my workflow is a little bit different to yours, but, but I have, I have more general topics that are, that are well-defined and well-known. And, and then I have different consumers that are listening for different events. Now, okay. what you've described is dynamic topics. Uh, can you compare and contrast these? Because honestly, the dynamic topics isn't something that I'd even thought about. And But my gut is it adds a level of complexity that makes the whole system hard to reason about. Uh, I want your take on that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And someone had actually had brought that up when we were um, uh, building it. They said, so if it only creates topics based on the metadata, what if I want to have it go, the data be streamed to a topic that I want? And that's where what was interesting, I said, well, when you are writing your uh, Genesis service, for example, or any of your microservices that are listening to topics, nothing stops you from at the same time saying, I want you to send it onto this topic. So let's say I have data coming in, as you said, I have a very general, um, static topic that I always use called, I don't know, uh, what was brought up was audit logs. Someone says, I want logging. I want to know, you know, did this data go here or here? Um, did it go through this process, this step? Or did it just came, come in? Um, and so what I said is, yeah, you can actually take any of those microservices and you can fork it and you can say, okay, yeah, it's going down the normal dynamic route. Um, but I also coded in to say, this also gets copied onto this other topic that is coded, configuration as code. Right? So I would do it configuration, not hard coding, obviously, the value. But you could have a configuration file that says, here's all the topics. Um, and hey, if you have a microservice, uh, when I build microservices, I always give them unique IDs. 
So when they spin up, they're spin up with a unique ID. So I take a config file and say, here's a config file. Here's all the microservice unique IDs and any topics I want you to send the data to on top of whatever is dynamically built. So when the service spins up and it says, I found I'm ID 124, and I look through the config, anything with 124, those are topics I'm going to copy to as well uh, downstream. So that's one of the ways that I sort of handled some of that um, topics to replicate data to topics that were not part of the metadata. It, it wouldn't be generated dynamically. I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, a little bit, a little bit. And, and, and I think we're probably gonna dive a little deeper as we go through. So, so yep. let me ask you this as well. If, um, you know, so one of the things that I, that I really see as huge about this, this, this type of approach, and, and I, and I, and I, I'm starting to learn that, that my approach is not as mature as yours, but I've also maybe have a, a simpler use case, but, but you hit on something really, really powerful and that regulations around data changes, you know, we've, we, we've gone through these phases in our industry from, uh, well, disk storage is expensive. And so we're only gonna store what we need to store. And then suddenly we want to data warehouses, which were great if you knew exactly what you wanted to get out of that data warehouse when you built it. But there's a point where you're, you're just, they're just too rigid. And, and they, and they, they aren't, you can't be competitive in today's economy if you need to make crucial business decisions off of that data, because there are other approaches and other structures that other organizations have adopted uh, that allows them to eat the, the established organizations, the enterprises lunch. So, you know, so we've, we've gone into this, we've gone into these different hype cycles from let's have a data warehouse to let's have a data lake. And, mm -hmm. and we got to this point where we could store everything. We could, we could record and store everything that we ever see, that we ever touch, that anybody ever does. And we're going to figure out how to monetize it, how to, how to leverage that data later. And then suddenly that became a problem. We got regulations, we got privacy shield, we got GDPR, we got, uh, there's another one of these that, that I think has come out. And, and so now we're in this weird situation. We've got a lot of data. We've got our processes that are established but suddenly we do need to obfuscate, as you say, or, or anonymize or, or disidentify data. And with traditional rigid approaches to building this stuff, you have a whole lot of code that you've got to yank out and that you've got to put back in there. And, and again, this takes a long time and this introduces yep. a lot of risk. I love what you've described as, oh, we have this new requirement, layer on that capability and the, because you're describing, it sounds like durable, durable topics, durable cues, I can go back and reprocess things yes. and reprocess yes, just the parts that I need. Correct. And what's interesting is this, and I think someone has that question uh, in the chat of how do you deal with data that fails from processing the first time and when it continues to fail when, when retried. That's a great question. Um, it is. It really is. And one of the things that we had done is we build a topic called errors or throwouts or rejects. Um, and that's what I meant with sometimes you've coded or configuration as code. You configured a topic that is mandatory regardless of metadata. So the rejects, let's call it a rejects topic. Um, the microservice, when it has an error, obviously you want to make sure you're doing really good error handling so you can find out why it, it bottoms out. And the microservice then sends it to the reject topic. Now, what you can do is reactive architecture and say, I'm going to watch that topic with a microservice. And maybe I do retry it, send it back down again, see if it was something where it was an issue with performance or whatever, uh, timed out or something. But the other thing you can do also is say, if I'm getting a whole bunch of these rejects coming from this one microservice, and I start to analyze it, and I see, oh, it's because our microservice doesn't handle I don't know, some for a date format properly, let's just say. What you can do is you can actually change that microservice on the, you know, make, make the correction, it's a bug, you fix the bug and you can replay those now and say, okay, now it's going down the pipe again and this time they're gonna be provisioned correctly. So that's how we handled some of the retries. Um, it is important that you are collecting those errors. 
whether you're doing it in the background, you're using Splunk with, I don't know, or Datadog or whatever, or if you actually send it to a topic called rejects or however you want to handle it, but somehow you want to make it um, that you're really managing those errors. And usually if there is an error, it's because of a coding issue. Um, there's a bug in it. If there is an error because of performance, that's where you want to look at like a delegator model where you can automatically scale up as more load comes in on that one step to that one microservice. So now what you're talking about, as, as I would describe it, is uh, workflow. Yes. That, yep. that, that you have exactly, you're, you're basically building the bones of a, a workflow event processing system. Uh, so, so I know, and again, one of the things I love about this, this style of architecture is you don't have to know what the exceptions are at the time that you build it. Uh, right. All we have to know is what do we do with an exception? And in this case, it's throw it over there. And right. we're done with it, right? It didn't work. And that comes back to your core point at the beginning when you said, do you remember when, and so many so many of my sentences start with, do you remember when now? I, 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 I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm getting old, but um, <laughs> because I am. But when you said, do you remember doing like a 50 million row ETL job and 49 million, 500,212 fails and you've, you know, sometimes you kill your entire batch. Sometimes mm -hmm. you lose that, but it's, that, that it's also rigid and, yes. and you've got yes, something yes. dynamic. So mm -hmm. something fails. And, and I love this approach of just throwing that onto a topic because if we're talking pub sub and not queues, your right. pub subs are typically durable. And what I might do is build a microservice that listens on that errors topic and just presents it as a dashboard. Here's what? kind of what the system looks like. And now I can look at this and say, oh, we're getting a lot of this type of error. We probably need to handle that. But now I've got all of the event source information. So I can, I can take that one event and walk that through locally, find the issue and find, figure out how to remediate it. But I don't have to go change my code now that's already in production. I build a new microservice that remediates that one problem, get, get yeah. it shipped in your, like you said, in a couple of hours, zero risk yeah. to breaking any existing functionality. It pulls those, those particular messages off the topic and then throws them, do they throw them back into your Genesis queue or what does that look like? Uh, you would throw them back right after the Genesis queue. So okay. wherever you're starting your, your flow after the Genesis queue. And that's where it's really, you know, one of the practices I use is, like I said, microservices have IDs. So every time they spin up, they have a unique identifier. And when it sends it to the topic, it says, hey, this error errored out with microservice 125. Mm -hmm. And this is the error message and the reason, right? So if you have that standardized error schema of how it's uh, of, of an error itself, an error object, and you attach it when you put it in the, in the, the topic with the data, it makes it really easy as you were saying, I'm gonna first and foremost, get eyes on it. Just like you said, like make a report, something I can see what's going on. As soon as I see that, gee, we're having so many errors from microservice 125, which is where we obfuscate the people's phone numbers. Why? Well, we're getting European phone numbers now coming in. Didn't know that. Oh, okay. Like you said, let's make a microservice for that one. Fix it. And it becomes reactive architecture. It, yeah. it becomes a, a, a point where I can actually have intelligence enough to fix its own errors and we can fix them at the last responsible moment, right? We don't try to build it all out with every possible combination. We, as the data changes, we're, a, we're adjusting accordingly. So tell me about your unique IDs because you're saying uh, every microservice gets a unique ID. Are you talking about every microservice instance or microservice logically gets its unique logically. ID? Logically, okay. logically, yes. Yep, yep. No, not the instances, the, the logical, yep. That way we just, we just know what service it came from, not which instance or what pod or whatever. Correct. Okay. Yep, because a lot of times we don't know where, think about that. This was always interesting to me is, 
application teams were able to find root cause for their bugs. They can backtrace it. In the IAM world, it is tough. This report doesn't look right. I'm sure we've all heard that, right? This, these numbers don't look right. Oh man, they're aggregated. You're, you're bringing flashbacks, man. Oh, I'm telling you, it's a pain and you got to work backwards and then go through these batches of millions of records. And with this, um, you know, like one thing that I did in the, in the privacy kit is data lineage. So I can actually look at the data object and on it is a lineage chain. And I can say, this is all the places you've been. Now, if we even have IDs on the microservices when error is being thrown, root cause analysis is real easy. I can go right to that microservice and I can look at the object and say, show me all the places you've been. So those are the type of designs that can really help with resolving these issues. And yeah, dealing with data is hard. <laughs> For real. I, I, I agree. And data is usually a mess. Uh, and it, and it, it's always wrong in a brand new way. Um, yes, you're right. <laughs> 20 years and I'm still discovering new ways for data to be wrong. I remember writing ETL back in my days, in the dark days of me being a DBA. And I was writing I was writing ETLs and I got these dump files from a client, a major uh, investment bank. And they were dumped. We were getting these dumps from their mainframe in a basement somewhere, who knows where. And... Um, the randomest stuff in there. I found the bell character uh, dumped into oh. these dump files. I'm like, where would that even come from? Yeah, but it's true. So uh, I know we're getting close on time, but I want to cover one more thing because sure. what I've discovered in my career, and, and now I'm going to preface this, of course, anybody who's here at a no fluff uh, webinar on their Friday morning, Friday afternoon, Friday evening, Friday night. Again, we've got a global audience these days, which is awesome. But uh, anybody who's tuning into this webinar, you're you're a self-selecting group. You are, you are outliers in my experience. Just having been to a lot of events, talked to, worked with a lot of developers, and uh, and 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 been all over on my journey. But I find that it's a little bit of a mind shift for folks to go from traditional monolithic architectures to microservice architectures that are largely request response based moving into event driven architectures that it's just we're not used to thinking in this way of i get something i do something with it i'm and i and i and i throw it over there that that i don't i don't know what happens next i don't care what happens next and that's a weird thing in my experience to, for people to, to really wrap their head around because we, we don't want to just throw a transaction into the vast void. Yeah, yeah. We want to know that it did what it's supposed to do. What's your advice for folks who are new to event-driven architectures? Yeah, um, that's like a really good question because that was one of my challenges, uh, especially if you've you know, been in it for years and you're trying to learn something new and you have all these biases in your head. Um, one of the things I did when I started learning the saga pattern and, and other architectural patterns with event driven, it comes down to, do you understand what a deliverable is? So, and I know it's going to sound wonky, but it's really all about agile, agile architecture and agile, how we work. The deliverable should be small, complete deliverables. And that is a microservice. This one service does this step. And I've tested it, I've delivered it, I maintain it. It's a complete deliverable. It's documented how it works, all of it. As I put all these deliverables together, I finally get my business product that I'm hoping for, which is, I'm shooting for, which is, you know, it's going down here and it comes up here, it gets aggregated, gets, you know, masked, whatever, and then it comes out as this great report, or maybe it's something that's gonna make them do machine learning to, you know, drive your business and make decisions. And so a lot of times what I had to learn was stop looking at the whole picture all at once. You can't boil the ocean. You got to look at each individual microservice component, there, that step, and say, is this delivered completely? And once it is, I've added value, I move on to the next one because that is valuable. I mean, think about this. If I have a microservice that obfuscates phone numbers, I don't just use it in this one flow. I can use it in many flows. And so... 
I don't care if it's coming because of uh, we're trying to clean up some data from an application about someone's contact information or if I'm using it for reporting. And all of a sudden, you start looking at it as like, wow, that Lego part has a lot of value. And I think that was the biggest thing for me to try to get past of don't boil the ocean. Don't look at the whole thing all at once because the, the whole process is made up of many, many little parts that can be reused everywhere else. And I think that was just for me, that was an epiphany of saying, you know, break it down into small, little, complete deliverables. Okay. The light bulb just went off on the dynamic topics. Aha. <laughs> this microservice is not just this step in this workflow. It is a function that we can that that we can invoke a number of ways. Okay. Yes. Penny and all of a sudden I can turn those, I could even go serverless if I wanted to, if it's small enough. Yeah. Technically. And now you've got a, but, but without, but you're still massively decoupled. Yes. Um, yes. Yep. Okay. All right. It's, I'm it's starting to get excited concept. about this. <laughs> uh, we've got a question in the chat, by the way. Um, oh, okay. This is from Thomas. Thomas asks, does this relate to data mesh slash service? Um, boy, that's a really good question. Now, when we're talking about um, when we're talking about data as a service, originally I had came up with it thinking that it's a service for the consumer. However, it's really all the microservice. I, I guess I should have called it what dams. Um, for microservices instead of just services. It is a mesh. However, one thing that I did learn is, and this is where that, that light bulb went off, but I, I do want to warn people. If you make them too small, and as a true, I'm, I'm meshing it all together, um, it becomes really tough to maintain. So if you go too small on those services down to functional, it's a lot to maintain. If I do data service now, if we're talking data service like in 2008 and, and prior where it came out data as a service, I'm not talking that. That's, that's, the, that's the monolithic where you, know, you have a service, an API, and behind it is all your databases and it routes and, and gets the data for you. I'm not talking that. Um, so in one, in one way, yes, it relates. And another way, I do want to warn not to go down to too fine a granularity. I hope that answers your question um, from the terms data mesh and data service the way I interpret it. But if, if I didn't, please explain or clarify the terms. And it might be worth just because I, in my experience, having talked to a lot of folks, data mesh is becoming one of those things where if you ask five developers, five architects, five whoever's, uh, you're gonna get eight different answers. You will. Um, and Oh, good, thanks. Okay. Like one of them, I mean, if you go to a, a mesh with Docker, right? Uh, that's another term that I'm, and that's my, the first thing that came to my head, believe it or not, was with the Docker swarms and the meshing there. Um, but data meshing for me really is all about creating the tiny little functions that can be called in any way to actually uh, provision the data. That's how I was always using it and terming it. But if I'm wrong on that term or, or misunderstanding the term, please you know, correct me on that one. I do not consider myself an authoritative source, but I would open this to the chat. Okay, great question. Any recommendation, any resources you can recommend using to learn more about the concept and product? And before you answer, I, I wanna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sure. enrich this question a little bit because we're coming right up to the end of our time here. So uh, what I'd actually like to do is uh, answer that question in part of uh, basically your closing thoughts here. Cause we're gonna have to wrap up here in just a few minutes. So okay. what I was going to ask you is, what recommendations for anybody who's on this webinar right now or watching the replay, they're like, these ideas are interesting. Uh, I, I want to, I want to take the next step. So, uh, so what advice do you have to be, what, what advice do you have for folks to take next steps? Um, and maybe leave that as closing thoughts because we've got one more question. I want to try to slip in 
and then we'll go to the closing thoughts. If that sounds reasonable to folks, I, I hope it mm -hmm. does because uh, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so the question is, uh, if multiple things need to be done to a piece of data, would you put that all into one service or multiple services and how would you chain them? Uh, I think that question gets to the very heart of this approach. And, it's, and that is the balancing act. As I always said, architects are curators of technology and design. That's what we do. And so that question is exactly going to the point of being an architect. Personally, I try not to get too defined and detailed. So not, mac, not microservice below microservice. I would put them into a service. Remember, a complete deliverable. So if I have a step in the data provisioning, I'm going to make sure that it gets everything it can for what was expected for it to do. I would not try, you can, but I wouldn't try to go down the functional sizes at first. Start a little, you know, Mark Richards even says, you know, the service oriented versus microservice oriented. There is a, a reason for how you get there. You can always split it apart, but it's hard to put it back together. So I would start at the service level, um, just like you do for RESTful endpoints. How you define those is how you define these microservices. Um, and then, you know, how do you chain them together? This is where that microservice will say, my job is once I get the data and I have done something with it, I must have at least one topic default to go, okay? Even if it is stop as a topic, done. So I can see all the records that came in that were done provisioning. I might have multiple based on my configuration file when I start up of whatever I'm told, but that's how I would do it is actually configuration as code. I would have it automatically say, I'll read that file. There must be one at least that I send to downstream. And that way my business process flow is literally configuration. It's not coded, um, hard coded or anything like that. So if it's not metadata driven by the data itself as a topic that's being generated, you pull in that config file and it says, okay, I'm done provisioning this data, it has to go further downstream. So that whole processing um, business process becomes really dynamic and configurable. I love it, I love it. So you uh, were coming right up to the end of time here. So let's go ahead and jump over to your closing thoughts. Uh, and before we go into that, uh, I just wanna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let David have the last word here. So before we go into that, I just wanna thank you all for taking the time to join us. Uh, I, I truly hope you get a lot of value out of this. And we do these uh, we do these typically every week or every other week. You can follow all of these free webinars at nofluffjuststuff.com. If you want to catch a replay of this webinar or any of the past webinars, they're right there on the homepage, uh, right-hand column if you're on a, on, a, on a desktop screen. But you can see uh, the full history of the replays. And of course, if you want to dive deeper, we have the live half-day and full-day trainings that we run almost every day of the week. Uh, they're available a la carte if you want to dive into one training. And, and, and David, I'm not sure. Do you have any of these on the schedule yet? Not yet. I do not. Nope. I but, will be. I'm planning on doing that, plus also building out a privacy by design as well. Oh, awesome. That is that is super valuable. Uh, and, and these workshops, they're live, they're instructor-led, they're hands-on. And uh, of course, they're recorded in all of this as well. So if you want to dive into one of those, you can buy them a la carte. I think they start at 195 and, um, you know, but if you want to spend just a little more, it's an all you can eat plan. Uh, like I said, we do 15 to 20 a month. And uh, of course, if you want to, if you want to really blow this up, uh, you can buy that no fluff, just stuff golden ticket. And it is a, a, an embarrassment of riches of training and knowledge and experience for the next five years for one low price. Uh, so, so do check that out. And, um, and I do look forward to seeing folks at, at some of our live events as, as we start to uh, crawl, walk, run back into that space. Uh, but certainly we're, we're gonna continue to do some of the virtual events as well. But uh, uh, that's really it from me. Uh, the only thing I would mention with all of those pl pr plans and programs, you can share them with your teams or with your colleagues. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. So David, I'm gonna turn off my microphone and I'm gonna give you the last word. All right. Um, so to, to answer the question about resources that I recommend for learning the concept and products, a few things. One, learn brokering and eventing. There's a difference between event streaming, um, firehose, um, brokering, queuing. So do learn your eventing and how it's actually done and, and the concept of brokering with the pub subscribe model. 
The other thing I would say is um, also learn your microservices in the 12-factor app and how that's actually done. Um, microservices do have a lot of benefits to them. Um, and if you have a really good pattern, you can crank them out pretty well. And the last thing I would say is too many people <laughs> overlook data. Um, I'm a GUI developer. Why do I need to know data? I write just the back end. I don't have to do the database. The thing is that we all deal with data. It, IT wouldn't work without it. So the more you know about data, how to manage it, and you're thinking about it, even if you don't know maybe the steps of how to do it, such as privacy, such as um, aggregation, such as opsification and masking, learn data, learn how to manage it, learn your NoSQL platforms, whether using CouchDB or MongoDB or AWS you know, D D uh, DynamoDB. Um, definitely learn your data because you're going to find out that most everything that you can code, you can actually code faster with math and with data and then st instead of writing code. So those are the things I would recommend. And as far as the DAS itself, someone had asked me, you know, when, when you came up with this pattern and it's not mine, I just I started designing and coming up with it. I'm sharing it with everyone. Um, what does it cost? And it doesn't cost anything. So I'm not a person who's um, a freelancer. I believe in open source. I believe in, in a community like this. So if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, by all means, I had one person that took uh, one of my workshops and said, would you mind helping me out at my company to try to explain this? Absolutely, not a problem. So let me know if you if you need anything, you can catch me on LinkedIn. You can also check me on, on the GitHub. Um, all of my crates are actually written for Rust. So it's on crates.io. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm more than available and, uh, and reachable. So I hope everyone has a great day and a good weekend. And uh, I hope you're successful. <laughs> Have a good one, everyone.